Okay, thank you. Thank you guys for joining me here. The answer to the question how we get the, the experiments names basically randomly, but it's we also apply actually, so there's a specific, specific rule how exactly we use the different letters of the alphabet so the name looks nicely basically. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, uh, with you about the feature engineering process. So for whom of, for whom of you who was actually here yesterday, I already get like a high overview of what actually, um, how exactly we create our data pipelines. So, but in this talk, I'm going to talk specifically about, you know, like a, like an approach to transform the features in general, with application, like so on, without actually any application to drive SAI at all. It's more like, a, you know, like what kind of approaches you can use to, you know, to transform your feature in a way that will be quite useful for, for machine learning model. Most of this experience based on like my uh, experience from Kaggle. Some of these approaches are actually quite helpful to win a data science competition. Some of them completely useless in any case, but it's, you know, some, it depends on, where, on what kind of problem you have, what kind of data set you have on your hands. So it's, it's you know, it's, you never know basically, right? You always have to consider trying uh, several approaches to get the best results possible. So among people who kind of have name in industry, it's kind of, you know, the all, all, almost all of them actually agree that's a good feature engineering actually approaches does make a difference. You know, there is a guys like Andrew in, Pet, Petr Domingos, uh, Marios, Nicolaitis. So we all basically agree on the same thing. So feature importance, very, very, very important stuff. And by definition, basically, feature importance is a very simple thing, right? It's basically something that you do with your data to make uh, data understandable by your, machine learning, by your machine learning algorithms. And basically, that means you have to transform what the data you have on your hands into numbers. So what else can be, a thing, what else you can think as a feature engine? So like, that's a kind of motivation slide. You know, imagine yourself, you have like a simple uh, data problem. You have a bunch of blue points and, green and red points in a 2D space and you would like to uh, use a linear classifier to classify them correctly. Well, it's kind of not possible to draw a single line, right, to distinguish red versus blue. But if you transform the Cartesian coordinates into polar one, that has become very, that has become very simple. Actually, don't even, you don't even need the, the, the linear model here, just like basically a constant line. So, Again, uh, there is a bunch of steps, right, which actually you have to perform to build your data machine learning data pipeline. And data integration, data quality and transformations will be one of the most important ones, but right, but not something you can, we're not going to talk about these basically steps. We're going to talk about only this small piece. When you have already like, you know, some feature transformed into tabular view, you have your target, you have your features, now you have to transform your feature in some way that machine learning model can understand. Uh, you remember this slide from my yesterday presentation, basically, it's the same data set. It's basically exactly the same picture. Imagine also if you have like a four columns with your features, one column is your target. You have a target, you have a categorical features, you have a price, which is a numerical feature. Well, obviously, you can use price as it is, right? It's already a number, fine. The only thing actually you can consider it is deal with how you're going to deal with uh, missing values. Because not all algorithms you're going to use are actually can consume and understand missing values. Like for example, most of the logistic regressions they have no idea what to do with the missing values at all. Uh, XGBoost, LightGBM, actually they can deal with missing values out of the box. It's totally fine, just give the missing values like as it is. Uh, also for categoricals, obviously uh, there is not such algorithm actually which can uh, consume strings. Even LightGBM, let's say if LightGBM actually can deal with a categorical data, but before actually passing it in, you have to transform your categoricals into integers anyway. So that's something we're going to discuss uh, today, basically, right? Uh, and key elements to success, basically, is going to be dealing with your numerical features, categorical features, and target. Obviously, you have a text, you have various additional things you can apply, but I have a kind of limited thing, time, so I have to time only to cover these uh, three key uh, feature types. And for missing values, basically, you have a, uh, this uh, like a general approach. For example, if you have a binary feature and you have a missing value in between binary feature, you can actually can encode them as minus one for negative, zero for missing values, and plus one for positive examples. 
which kind of work for a lot of machine learning algorithms. Uh, for numeric features, for tree-based me methods, you usually encode, you can encode actually a feature as out of a distribution value. It's quite a useful technique. So let's say in that case, if your missing values actually mean something, the model, the, the model actually will be able to, to, to find this dependency and use it. For linear models and neural nets, you usually actually create a, a two user two columns instead of one. Like for example, on this picture, right? So basically, if you have a look on a version two, so what you do basically, you replace all missing values with a, with a, with a, with a mean, and you create additional column, which basically a flag, right? Zero, one, if was, was this value missing or not? And you put pass with uh, two values into your machine learning algorithm. Well, for categorical, it's quite simple, basically. Depending on what you think about your data, you can actually replace uh, the missing value with a specific category level. That makes sense if you think that uh, actually the fact that value is missing actually means something. You know, it actually like a, because basically you have two cases, right? The missing value may be by mistake, right? And actually the fact it's missing doesn't mean anything. You have to just use something from your data. Like you have to replace the missing value with a mod. Or actually the fact it's missing actually contains additional information about the data and about the target. In that case, you encode, you encode it as a, as, a, as a separate category level. So quite simple and straightforward approach. Uh, well, obviously, again, if you have a string values, you have to somehow encode them into like a meaningful numbers because most of the machine learning algorithms doesn't understand the, the, the categorical values, so it doesn't handle them uh, correctly. The simplest way to do that basically, you just randomly assign for each category level you have, you randomly assign an uh, integer number. It's kind of okay approach for tree based methods. It's definitely not okay to use it for linear model. It's not okay to use it in general because you somehow, you, you introduce some sort of a order notion in your data, which actually it's not the right thing because you know you just randomly assign some numbers. There is no actually notion of the order. But because you just decided to use a simple, uh, simple approach, that's how you did it basically, right? Our classical approach is going to be one hot encoding, which we're all familiar with, right? It's basically you encode your category with a binary vector. Uh, it's a very good approach especially if you have a category with uh, not a lot of levels, right? If you do have a category with a lot of levels, the tree-based methods doesn't like this type of actually feature because they become extremely sparse. Also, you're basically, if you have, let's say, if you don't have the ability to turn matrix into the sparse, it will require a lot of space, actually. To, you will require a lot of space to store it in the memory. Uh, one of the, actually, one of the hidden, uh, hidden, and I mean, hidden, hidden attribute of this type of data representation. Then you do XGBoost-like algorithms because you, you usually for build each tree, you actually have a subsample of a columns presented. That means in, some, in one particular tree, actually, you might have a missing category level, right? Let's say for first tree you build, you just sample uh, column feature equal one and column feature equal B, right? But you don't have any idea about feature equal C column. And because of it's actually some sample, you kind of create a more robust model. So in, in some cases, it might be quite beneficial. Uh, what else can you do? Well, you can encode actually your category features as a frequency, right? You just basically calculate how frequent you can see this category in your data. Or you can think about this uh, type of approach, like, you know, uh, what's the probability of hitting this particular level by my randomly sample, like, you know, one record from my data. It's quite a good approach because basically, it's quite robust. It, it has its own downfalls. For example, if you have a, uh, some categories which actually has exactly the same frequency, you won't be able to distinguish between them. So it's sometimes it's a bad thing. Extremely powerful approach, like one of the, but it's, uh, you have to be very careful implementing it. It's a target mean encoding. Then ideas, again, is quite simple. You just replace your category levels with a, 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 with a uh, calculated mean of the target. In our case, if you have a binary outcome, basically, they just replace it with a, uh, these, these numbers, basically. But I, I have to draw your attention to the fact that, say, for, for level C, we only, we only have just basically two examples. That's not statistically significant uh, sample, right, basically. We, not, we, we, not, we, not, we cannot rely on this estimated mean here because we just have only positive examples and just two examples. That's not enough. So in that case, actually, what you can do, you can apply smoothing. 
And idea is quite simple. But in, instead of actually calculating this, like you know, and replacing each value with a calculated mean, you you use a combination between mean of the level and the mean of the data set, and you calculate this mean actually. With a, the idea is quite simple. Let's say the if you have a, a small amount of uh, examples for a particular level, you push this calculated mean closer to the data set mean as possible, basically, because it's not reliable. You just have to, you kind of use pretty much the same uh, mean as, a, as your data set mean. But if you have enough samples, basically, right, in that case, uh, the, the majority of the weight is going to, uh, the mean of the level is going to have a majority weight in this, uh, in this, in this summation. Like, for example, sigmoid like function can be used to calculate the exact dates for these uh, two values. And, then, and you have two parameters to play with. So it's a k, which is inflection point, and uh, f is the steepness of the function. And inflection point basically shows you the amount of data points you will have in your data, then the weight is will going to be equal 0.5. Uh, it's a nice approach, it's quite flexible, but now you have to deal with the two additional parameters to, uh, to, to fine tune, which is, might be you know, not a good, but a good, good idea at all. And, if you see on the example, it still might be not very helpful to, you know, but actually I have to draw your attention to this example, you see? At, on the top portion of the, of the slide, you actually see this, uh, the inflection point equals two. And I would like to draw attention to the calculated mean of the level C. It's 0.88, so it's pretty far away from the mean of the, of the data set, which is 0.77. But if I change the inflection point to three, the mean of for level C is going to be 0.773 on the bottom of the screen, which is way much closer to the calculated data set mean. So that's what, that's what I meant by, you know, we try and if you have a less point, you kind of trying to push this uh, estimation value closer to the data set mean. It might be still not enough actually, you know, and in that case, what else can you do? Oh, actually no. If it's too complex, basically, there is additional approach how you can encode mean, mean encoding. Which you, it, the, this, in this approach, you just have basically a single parameter alpha, which is actually, you can think a bit, again, it's more like, you know, it's, a, it's the way how you can actually think of it. It's, you know, it's a reliable size of my uh, examples per, per category level, what, 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 I, what I can trust. It's not so good compared to a previous one. You see, I am changing alpha from two to three, and Please pay attention to the level C calculation. It's pretty much not changed. Like from 0.88, it's changed to 0.86. So it's, it's, okay, I almost run out of time. That's nice. Okay. <laughs> and it's like a half of a slide left. Good, good. That's a nice pace. Um, as you can see, this function actually slow, slowly converts to a uh, mean of a data set, which is maybe not too, too slow, basically, right? Uh, what else left? Oh, you can, uh, like, you also can actually use the leave one out approach, you know? And basically what you do, uh, you calculate, for each row in your data set, you calculate the mean for this particular row using the, left of le the rest of the data points. Like for example, for row number one, you use the, the rest of the three rows available. Oop. And you go through the data set like this, basically, to calculate it. But it's, again, for level C, it's not enough because we just have only uh, positive examples left. And that's what's going to be last. Bear with me, guys. Uh, that's the most, the most uh, tough approach, basically. You know, you can use expanding mean approach. And in that case, you introduce a lot of noise into your uh, targeting calculations. And sometimes it can actually build, help you to build more, uh, more robust models. But in some cases, it's too much noise. And what you do, you randomly shuffle your data to make sure there is no order between your category for your categorical feature. And then for each row in your data set, you calculate the, the mean using previous rows. If you never see this category level before, you replace it with a, a data set mean. Like for example, for row number one, we have B. We never saw feature B before because it's our first row actually in the data. So we just replace it with 0.77. Same goes with A. We never saw A level in our data before, so we replace it with a data set mean. For the third row, actually, we already saw B before and we use e this, this so seen value as, a, as, a, as, our, as our calculated target mean value. Same goes for A. Then we have a third A, and we calculate actually using previous two, and so on and so forth. As you can see, the data, data becomes more noisy in that case, so maybe for small data sets it might be not too tough basically, but for quite big data which has a long tail, 
categorical feature distribution, this might be quite helpful. So basically, uh, to summarize what I just showed you, you basically have two techniques to smooth the, pre the target mean estimation, and you have two techniques to add the noise. Obviously, some of them can be combined together and used in, in, you know, in use at the same time, which actually gives you more uh, control and more uh, way how you can actually control and not to overfit to your data. Uh, how many time left? Okay. Yeah, I think we can actually wrap up things uh, here, and I'm ready for the questions. The slides will be available after talk anyway, so we can. Just a couple of questions. Okay. How to do frequency encoding during feature engineering for production? For a specific role in production, I do not know how frequent a specific feature is. Well. So you have a training data set, right? For data training data set, actually, you can calculate your uh, frequencies, right? And for production, actually, you can use the calculated learned, oops, learned frequencies. Yeah, thank you. Uh, learned frequencies to replace the existing category levels. Can, int can introducing many features also lead to models performing worse on, oh, definitely, like all the time. Performing worse on the test set, in particular with a low signal to noise ratio. Yes, yes, yes. So basically, you usually, I mean, it's actually I got a question like uh, previously, like, hey, why don't we just you know, use all transformations available, throw it into the model and see what happens? Usually the results not going to be satisfying at all. So usually you're trying to find the best transformations available. And depending on the, like in case of a low signal to noise ratio, you might actually end up using a one hot encoding schema because it's more robust. In that case, you can, you know, like, it's kind of very hard to overfit this, uh, this approach. Is there a repository, cheat sheet, or similar list of feature engineering recipes for what I used in Gravity CI? No, I'm afraid no. There is a couple of my slide, my talks. This talk actually you can use as excitement. You can actually Google there is a couple of uh, GitHub repositories uh, from people who actually played on Kaggle. They kind of implemented uh, some of these approaches, but no, like you know, like a single point of, uh, of uh, data available. Some thoughts on weight of weight of evidence encoding clustering for feature engineering. Yes, we use it for driver CI all the time. I just didn't mention it in, in this talk because I don't have enough time, basically. But weight of evidence actually used for we use it in drivers for categorical level encoding all the time and as SMS clustering. Uh, embedding is not included. Uh, yes, it's kind of, I, 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 I was going to mention it at the end of the talk. So actually you can use a neural nets embedding as, a, as you know to learn by basically your categorical feature embeddings. But I don't have a ready recipe how to do it basically. For me it's always like, you know, it's always like from starting from scratch. So sometimes I, very, I can get like a very good embeddings in some, in some cases it's, it's extremely like basically a random noise. Then does, does driver CI use the different encoding methods? It's basically the natural trying them all during the uh, pipeline evolution process and stick to the best. We also have some predefined, like, like uh, based on our experience, like predefined uh, parameters and approaches, but it also requires actually some uh, uh, random search as well. What is more nonlinear, deep learning or GBM with massive feature engineering? The both approaches, deep learning and GBM, basically they both, neural nets and GBM, they both consider to be universal approximators. It really depends on the type of the data you have, mostly not about like massive feature engineering in general, but um, it does require different approaches to feature engineering. So let's say features which kind of useful for GBM might be completely useless for the deep learning and vice versa. So they do require like some different approach to massage data. For example, for deep learning, you have to normalize your data. And you have to think about the normalization schema because you have at least three of them, three type normalization schema available. For GBM, you don't have to normalize data at all. It's fine by default. So again, based on my Kaggle experience for tabular data, you can do whatever you want with deep learning. GBM is going, is going to perform better anyway. What works good for highly skewed distributed variables? Um, Target encoding with smoothing might work, but you probably also need, you know, to remove, uh, uh, let's say, to replace uh, low frequent categories with a dummy category level, for example. Just, you know, just unite them together into some like a dummy category level. 
that might actually improve the score and improve the robustness, robustness of your approach, of your algorithm, sorry. And that's all questions I've got. Thank you, guys. <laughs> actually, there's a last question. It's like, do we care about machine learning interoperability constraints in your model them, building models using drivers? Say, yes, we do. We have additional constraints if you're, let's say, if you put the interoperability level to 10, we actually dis disabled some, 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 of uh, some of the transformations completely. And for, addition, for some transformations like weight of evidence, we actually apply monotonicity constraint on top of it. So thank you. <laughs>